Our next speaker is Kurt Chankaya, and he'll be speaking on the human factor, manned or unmanned. Some thoughts on mission resilience. There you Thank go. You, Kurt. Let people settle for a sec. This is a disheartening room to speak in because it doesn't matter how many people are here, it still looks empty, you know? <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, yeah, just as people settle in, I'll, I'll just kind of give an introduction. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a private guy. I don't have, uh, you know, a, um, LLC. I'm not trying to find venture capitalists. This is just something I wanted to talk about at the convention here. And, and it's really talking about the, uh, the man versus unmanned issue. Um, there's, there's always been a kind of a tension between the two in terms of whether you need humans or not. Obviously, you know, we don't need humans if we're going on an unmanned mission that is designed to be unmanned mission. What I want to talk about is whether um, we have a lot of architectures that have unmanned uh, precursors to go and prepare the way. And, and they use a lot of autonomy or semi-autonomy to prepare the way and you show up and, and you know, all the fuel is, is drilled and, and the bed is made and, the, and there's mints on the pillow and, and it's all ready to go. And, uh, and whether that is something that drives up risk or not as opposed to having people along. So that's, that's sort of what I wanted to talk about. Um, so um, we'll just, that's right, you don't need to point at the screen. Now, we, everyone does that, but actually that's not where it goes. So, uh, so just as an introduction, um, we're seeing a lot of mission architectures that re, uh, require or are thinking about remote ro uh, robotics or unmanned precursor missions to prepare it. Mars Direct is one of them. And uh, Mars Direct actually has a pretty simple precursor mission where you land with a bunch of liquid uh, hydrogen uh, and then uh, pull CO2 gas out of the air and you do some magic chemistry and then poof, you got uh, your liquid fueled rocket to go back. And I, I don't want to make light of it. It's a very elegantly simple design and that's something that's actually relatively simple to do. But um, what we're also seeing now is, uh, is a number of architectures that are starting to build up where the precursor missions are doing a lot of robotic exploration, a lot of preparation, and also a lot of mining um, to look for underground uh, water. And, th and that starts to get a lot more complicated. So some of the advantages of having it all happen ahead of time is that uh, you do reduce your workload. I mean, if the robots do it, you don't have to do it. So you don't have to show up and, you know, and, and kind of drive the bulldozer around to pull up all the soil and everything. And there is the safety factor of having a fully fueled return vehicle. So if you, you get to Mars and something bad happened, you, you, you're surprised, you know, what do you mean there's no internet, there's no Wi-Fi, I'm going home. Um, you can just turn around and go back. You don't have to wait two years to refuel and so forth. So there's that safety factor. And of course, um, robotics and artificial intelligence are making huge strides. We're talking about autonomous driving cars. Of course, how hard can it be to be better than the average driver? But you know, it is uh, it is amazing to see what we're going to be able to do in a few years. But I want to pull back some some historical records and just some just kind of some talk about um, the hist uh, history of manned and unmanned spaceflight and where humans either did save the day or helped a lot or where they could have, and what that does in terms of the uh, de uh, technological development risk of making a fully autonomous or a, a fully remote uh, preparatory mission. Nice thing about humans is they're extremely adaptable. So it's one of the reasons we want to send humans to Mars. Um, humans can do a lot of maintenance. Humans can fix things when, that are unexpected. Humans can handle things that are unexpected in ways that are very difficult for a, a robotic mission can do. And there's quite a few examples in the both manned and unmanned spaceflight where that happened. And as I mentioned, a lot of the in-situ resource, once we discovered that there's a lot of water underground on Mars, and once we also started to ponder that, uh, you know, difficulties of hauling several tons of liquid hydrogen around the solar system, um, a lot of the architectures I've seen out of NASA are, are starting to talk about digging up soil and having underground uh, water, which is, you know, it's five to 90% water in almost every place in Mars we, we've looked that uh, dig up that and use that water rather than bringing our own hydrogen with us. But mining is a much more difficult process than just pulling a CO2 atmosphere and having your own liquid hydrogen that you brought with you. You don't need to just open a couple of valves. There's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, bulldozing to, to doing that. So that adds a lot of development risk in order to do that on its own. 
And I'd, I'd like to also kind of just uh, discuss a little about the idea of the, the immediate abort return. It's somewhat limited because of the realities of plat uh, planetary mechanics. It's not like, oh, I have a fully fueled you know, return vehicle, so 12 months into my uh, 24 months on Mars, I decided that I've had it and there's no fresh food and I want to hear what's happened with the Kardashians, so I'm out of here. Uh, you can't really come back whenever you want. There's only a short window. So basically, your, your uh, fully fueled return vehicle is only useful for the very beginning of your mission. So I'd say that having, if you're going to have men go anyway, okay, people, if we're going to have people go anyway, a, a, f a fully manned architecture with man-tended uh, ro uh, semi-autonomic robotics may be a much lower technical risk and therefore drive down development, cost development, schedules, and all those kind of things that we're all trying to do in order to make Mars happen. So. A past example, of course, you know, the human exploration outside of the uh, Earth orbit. Uh, we have got one example, the Apollo program, where we had nine missions that went to the moon. Um, and four of them, what I would say is, is that four of them, if they had been unmanned precursor missions, would have been failures. Uh, and just, uh, there would be Apollo 10, 11, uh, 12, and 13, and that's, uh, that's all in the beginning, uh, with Apollo 8 seeming to have, uh, you know, sneaked by. But Apollo 10, which was the first dress rehearsal flying on the moon. It was the first time they took the LEM to lunar orbit. They, uh, they descended to very close to uh, the lunar, uh, lunar surface, about 50,000 feet, and then they, uh, they hit the, um, you know, they flipped to um, ascent, and uh, not, you know, always, always known at the, um, at the time is that they went out of control. The, uh, the LEM went into a, 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 spot, a spin with an uncommanded uh, rotation, it also led to the first swear word going out over the American uh, television network, as I think was Stafford um, said, gosh, golly darn. Um, and uh, and what, it, what happened? He actually flipped one of the wrong switches. Yeah, that's, that's what I said by due to programmer error. So, you know, in a sense, they went in a, in a rotation that became quite dangerous. And in post-test, uh, post-flight analysis, they, they, I think they went around seven or eight times. And they said there were about three more rotations, and they would have been unrecoverable, and they would have crashed and died. So this was a real close-run thing. At NASA didn't advertise it. Hey, we almost killed the astronauts. Let's go Apollo 11. Uh, it wasn't something that they did at the time, but there was a lot of uh, concern behind the scenes and so forth. Now, as, as you pointed out, that... Um, um, the, the humans entered the, uh, the error that they recovered from, you know, so the pilot's intervention saved the day, but they also were the ones that caused the problem to save the day in the sense that they had put in a, a incorrect uh, programming error. And of course, this is Apollo where programming meant, you know, putting in actual numeric words and, and hex into, you know, barbarically primitive computers, which is why they could do it in eight years instead of 50. And so um, one of the... <laughs> One of the things about this, though, is that there are a lot of software errors that happen on and throughout the space program. Voyager almost shut itself down because of software errors. There's a lot of things. Software errors are not going to go away just because we don't have humans along to flip the wrong switch. Apollo 11, I think it's pretty famous where they're, they're coming into land and they had a computer located location and the, and the guidance system was going right to the right spot. And, and Neil Armstrong looked out and went, whoa, those are some mighty big boulders. And he grabbed control and he just about ran it down to, you know, empty as he's searching around and, you know, the Iceman, that's why he was one of the reasons, my opinion, why he was chosen, his heart rate never moved as they were, but they were sure moving down on the ground as they went down to just about no fuel and he landed in a nice safe place. But um, that intervention was, if it had been a fully automated mission, it would have landed in a bunch of boulders, it would have been a total loss and that would have been the end of it. Apollo 12 was struck by lightning. It turns out that they launched into a bit of a thundercloud and, uh, and a rocket motor going up, spews out a lot of um, you know, hot gases and funny ions and water, and it turns out to be a really great lightning rod. And uh, it got struck by lightning twice going up, and uh, the system was not designed for lightning. We can build systems to withstand lightning. That's what, this wasn't one of them. It turns out the inertial guidance system on the Saturn V had an inadvertent lightning isolation system because it was set off on rubber isolators in order to uh, prevent it from vibration. So the Saturn V kept on cooking and doing its thing, and it didn't even know what was going on. But the inside the capsule, they blew every circuit breaker, every warning sign was going off, and they pretty much were convinced that they had a mission abort. Um, and they, they ended up having, you know, somebody in the ground, oh, yeah, 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 I remember this, try and fix this. And they fixed it. The crew intervened, they refixed it. But the other part is that they refixed the inertial uh, references, which were totally lost because they lost all their gyroscope uh, power. 
And none of that, you know, it's very hard for a machine that is not designed to withstand that catastrophic a failure to recover. And humans were able to do it. They went out, do a few sextants, you know, did the uh, Galileo thing, and they went out and got out their sextant, and they, they did a few star sightings, and they got their recalibration off to the moon they went. Uh, so that was a, a really good recovery of something that probably would have been, if they had been uh, a, a fully automated mission, just would have gone into the, you know, into orbit, and it would have been dead, and they would have been like, well, what happened? You know? Apollo 13, you know, we've all seen the movie, um, don't need to go through the gory details, a big oxygen tank explosion, uh, catastrophic damage to the, uh, uh, to the um, service module. They ended up having, you know, there's a term they use called LOM lock, loss of mission, loss of crew. This was a LOM, they lost the mission. They did not miss the crew. The crew had to do a lot of improvisational stuff. You could say, well, if they weren't on there, they wouldn't have needed to do any improvisational stuff to save them. But again, it's one of those things where the crew was able to do a lot of things that were way outside the design uh, space in order to figure out how to fix the system. So if we had gone through with a fully you know, autonomous system, you could make an argument that Apollo 14 would have been the first successful mission to Mars, I mean, to the moon. And uh, can you imagine the politics of crew after crew dying or, or billion dollar v vessel, one after the other, smashing into the ocean or into the moon in total failure? It probably would have meant cancellation. Uh, you really need a more, much higher reliability system. And it was, it was humans, it was the fact that it was man that allowed that to do that. So, um, is, did I skip one? Yeah, I skipped one. So, looking at Mars, um, you've heard of the Mars curse. Um, I, I think the Mars curse is overdone. I think the Mars curse is that all movies, except for The Martian, made about Mars are really bad. Um, but um, if you look at all the uh, missions to Mars there, you have all the missions that have happened since 1960, and they're divided up by Russia, by the United States, and others. And red you know, or orange means that uh, it didn't work or it didn't work enough to consider it a mission success, maybe a few seconds of operation. And the green means it worked, and blue means that it's working right now. And you can see there's a lot of red up there. Um, you also see that it tends to be Russian, and it also tends to be early on. Now, I don't want to blame the Russians. There are you know, a lot of smart people in their space program. They have an excellent safety record of getting people into space. But landing things on Mars is not one of the things they've uh, had a lot of success at, mostly because of most of these things happened very early in the space program. We're talking about missions in 1960, 1962, where we didn't really know a lot of what was going on. Uh, a lot of the American uh, missions have been successful, and particularly they've been successful lately. So you see a real uh, divergence between the different countries and their success rates. That's a whole other subject that, uh, that uh, we could get into at some other time. But I wanted to point out the graph on the bottom where you can see the success rate by decade or by era. And you can see it's a real learning curve where, yeah, it was really bad in the beginning, but in the 21st century, we have over an 80% success rate. You know, the, 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 the world has an 80% success rate, and the U.S. has a 100% success rate of sending probes to Mars. So there's been a real steep learning curve. And now you're getting to the point where robotic missions are on the level pretty much of what the Apollo missions were, which had a 91. If you, you know, you take the Apollo 13 as a, as a failure, then uh, of the nine Apollo missions, you had one failure, in, or I think 11 Apollo missions when you count some of the you know, Apollo 7 and Apollo, uh, Apollo 9. It had a uh, single mission failure. So you're talking about a uh, mission rate where now it's getting to the point where maybe I don't need a lot of robotic precursor preparation to ensure my safety. So cases where human touch um, could have helped or did help. Um, first of all, I did a boo-boo. That's not Skylab, that's Hubble, sorry. Um, I did a cut and paste there. So when I was, when dinosaurs ruled the earth and I was a kid, um, I went down to watch on my vacuum tube, analog, black and white television with rabbit ears, the Apollo astronauts bounce around on the moon and you saw on the bottom, live from the surface of the moon. And I was like, wow, you know? And, uh, and you see the you know, Apollo astronauts, 12, 13, 14, 15, bouncing around in the moon. Well, not 13, um, 14, 15. And they were using a lunar rover. And they would go and do their thing. And then when they would, they would get back on the lunar rover, and they couldn't broadcast television while the lunar rover was moving. So in the days before digital effects, they had a little diorama on, I guess, CBS News. And they had a little you know, battery-powered lunar rover. And it would bounce along. And they would show this for like, you know, 30 minutes or whatever it took them to go to the next spot and, and would do that and so forth. And one time they were, you know, bouncing along in their simulation, simulation, you know, and this was live television. And so it ran into something and it got stuck. Boof, boof, boof. 
And then this huge hand came down and picked it up and moved it over. And then it went on its way. And how many mission commanders of unmanned probes have said, boy, of what I'd give for 30 minutes or 20 seconds of that hand. You know, look where that camera wasn't designed to look. You know, pull that stupid stop pin that was supposed to fall off and so forth. And so you look through, even a lot of successful missions have had issues where a human could fix it in a few minutes where people had to really do some jumps through it. Uh, Galileo, not saying people should go to orbit around Jupiter, it's a little bit toasty um, in terms of radiation, but uh, Galileo was a beautiful, powerful probe and it sent it out and uh, its main antenna got stuck and it never opened. And so they lost, uh, they lost uh, about, I don't know, three, four orders of magnitude of data rate coming back from that thing. And they, uh, they lost 80% of the, the datas uh, that they expected to pick up. They did a lot of great reprogramming. Um, they ended up being a successful mission, but all it needed was a guy to go up there and just kick it, you know, with, you know just pull on it with his hand, poof, and it would have opened. Um, mere spirit died stuck up on a rock. That's something that uh, any, probably any one of us in the room could go on and have fixed out in about 30 seconds. Just, boop, you know, the, like the great hand. Uh, Viking. Viking 1 uh, seismometer never deployed. Se Viking 2 seismometer got a lot of wonderful data that was really been uh, very, very useful. It would have been great to have two, get, kind of get that stereo picture to look deep inside the planet. And we haven't put another seismometer on there in a long, long time. But Viking 1 seismometer got stuck, and I think the, the general feeling is that a, a retaining pin to keep it safe for launch never came out. Again, another thing that would have been just a few minutes, uh, you know, a few minutes for a human to you know, pull it out. Uh, we lost contact with Viking because someone sent the wrong command and pointed the antenna in the wrong direction. Again, you know, it's another one of those things where, you know, repairman is a long way away. Phoenix, wonderful uh, probe, very, very great success. Um, they had wonderful design of picking up a nice scoop of soil and sticking it in, going through the nice little sieve down to their uh, chemical analysis. And instead, there was this wonderful discovery that there was a lot of perchlorates in the soil. Well, perchlorates, among us other many... Uh, you know, oddities, makes uh, things kind of clay-like. And so they pulled up this soil, and it was more like ice cream, and went, fuck. Now what do we do? That's the kind of thing that humans are really adaptable at changing. Uh, Skylab, obviously, you know, um, did a, you know, got damage going up into orbit, and there was a lot of on-orbit repair done by the crew. Um, the other Skylab, also known as Hubble, um, was able to be fixed, went up cross-eyed, and was one of the most successful, if not the most successful and profoundly important space probes ever made, and it would have been a complete write-off if we couldn't have sent humans up to fix it, because it went up with the wrong optics. And I bet you one of the things that Hubble, uh, um, James Webb, is going through is, in, you, know, you didn't make another Hubble mistake, did you? And that may be, Kurt's uninformed speculation, is that's why it's taken so long, cost nearly $9 billion to build that thing, is that when things have to work the first time, all the time, and no human can ever intervene no matter what happens, the testing and risk avoidance in the design and the cost just go up exponentially. And so it's very expensive to build things that are completely unmanned-tended. Doesn't solve all your problems. Mars Observer, as far as we know, when it was going about to go into Mars orbit and they, uh, they you know, lit the fires for the retro rockets and exploded, not a lot you can do about that. So it doesn't solve all your problems, but there's a lot of cases where humans could fix things that were very difficult or impossible to fix in an unmanned probe. Whoops. So if we go to autonomous surface operations, as I said, many of the mission architectures are starting to look at mining. On the left, you see a photograph of the uh, Mars site with, uh, with its bulldozer out there in the, on the bottom and in, in the center. You see um, what mining looks like in the United States or you know, in the world today. Um, kind of the picture you want to get across there is that when you mine, uh, there's nothing that's lightweight involved. This is all pretty heavy stuff, pretty sturdy stuff. And, uh, and anybody who's dug in their backyard knows that mining or digging in the dirt is always full of surprises. How much, you know, is I'm going to come across a giant rock? Or am I going to run into, you know, different types of soil? I mean, we just put scoops in the soil and we run into surprises. What it's going to do when we try to dig up, you know, what could be, if we, you know, try to get into 5 or 10% water soil and create a few hundred tons of fuel, are we going to be digging up thousands of tons of soil? That's, that's not a minor digging job. Um, and so in the um, lower right, you see a graph of, of an apples and kumquats comparison. 
of Apollo 17 and Opportunity. I know there were very different missions. They had very different drivers, da 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 But it took um, Opportunity about 10 years to go 40 kilometers. It took Apollo 17 three days to do almost the same amount. Now, they didn't stop as many times, um, and they didn't do as much science along the way, but the, you know, if we could see the rovers operate in real life, um, speedy, fast, you know, those are not the terms we'd use because we're doing things very slowly and very deliberately and so forth. If there are humans close by, even if the humans weren't operating it, not joysticking it, but were around to fix it in case it went off, you know, got hit and stuck on a rock or went into a sand pit or something, we could move these a lot faster. And so um, human operated or human tended or human, uh, you know, attended equipment can be a lot, uh, lot faster. And as I mentioned, that um, if I make something that can be repaired if necessary and can be, you know, have a human intervene if necessary, we end up with something that is much, much cheaper and lower risk and allows me to be more daring in my technology that I incorporate than it would be if I was something, doing something that had to be entirely on its own. So in that sense, it would probably be a lot cheaper and a lot easier to send down my semi-autonomous bulldozer to go and dig up my fuel and regolith and prepare my base while I'm there so that if it, you know, some cotter pin falls off or whatever, um, I can go over and fix it instead of having it uh, designed to the nth degree so it never happens. Last thing about the orbital return window, um, it is an advantage of a fully autonomous preparatory mission that uh, if I show up and something bad happens, and I find out the internet's too slow or whatever, that I can go back right away. Um, and I think when the uh, preparatory mission is relatively simple and low risk, and I'd, I'd put, you know, Bob's um, uh, you know, Mars Direct on that as, um, as one of those because it uses, you know, liquid and gases, but when we're doing something more complex, it's a little bit harder to do. One thing you have to remember is that um, because of orbital mechanics, and, you know, this is not to scale, do not use this for, for you know, um, navigation. Um, if I go on a free return orbit, and I'm showing up at Mars, and I'm ready to go down, that means I'm in pretty good shape, I don't want to go home, my ship's in good shape, and what's down on the ground, I got all this telemetry, it says it's in good shape, and then if I show up there on the ground, I probably have at most a month or so before I'm so far out of alignment, I can't come home anyway. So unless something really dramatically happen, bad happens that first month, when everything was fine just before I went down, it really doesn't give me a, an advantage of safety. And in thinking through this, the only thing that would really happen that would cause a problem like that is probably a problem during landing. Parachutes don't open. Heat shield didn't work. Retro rockets didn't work. And the problem is, is that when historically we've seen that, and when you think through those things, those are all fatal. We've never had a, a lander land on another planet and get really banged up, but it's kind of survived. It's either pretty much in perfect working order or pretty good working order, or it's smashed to pieces. And so I'd put forward that perhaps the fully fueled return vehicle is not quite the safety valve that it, um, we might think, and therefore is it worth that much in terms of extra costs for semi-autonomy or autonomy in a preparatory mission. And I think that is, um, that is it. I'm, uh, I'm near time, so um, does anybody have any questions? Couldn't some of the repair features be done by a um, humanoid-style robot operated remotely? It, it very well could. Um, and again, the, the wild card in this is how fast robotics and artificial intelligence are all moving. Now, if it's operated, if it's like, you know, joystick remotely, you're talking about, I mean, imagine the steps that it take to, you know, go change a washer on your kitchen sink if every single move took 40 minutes to command. But if it's something where the robot is smart enough to go, oh, I know how to change the washer in your sink, and does it on its own, then that's a, that changes the game, and that could, that could really change this calculus. Yes? Anybody else? Uh, Want to wait for the mic? Or? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm slightly skeptical of, okay. of some of... Uh, the positions put forth. Um, move back. Um, you have a magnetic personality. Uh, well, some of the, uh, the the cases you put in in terms of uh, if we had a human there, it would have saved the day. And 
at face value, that's true, but it may have not been feasible, certainly like in the case of Galileo <coughs> to Jupiter. Um, so then it's a different kind of risk. So uh, on the one hand, autonomy, uh, a risk uh, of mission loss, and basically boils down to a financial loss, possible political hit, versus loss of life. Um, so in, in some cases, to have a human there would be a one-way trip. Well, I think uh, the Galileo one was just an interesting one because it was just something really simple. You know, and, and I think I try to mention that uh, I'm not saying humans should go, should go to Jupiter in order to unstick the antenna. There are times when you want to do things. You know, deep space beyond Mars obviously is going to be fully autonomous. Um, what I'm saying is that if you, know, you don't send humans along on an unmanned mission just in case something goes wrong. You send, if I'm sending a manned mission, rather than have an unmanned mission ahead of it to prepare the way, do them in parallel so the human can reduce the risk and the cost of the preparatory work. That actually, I, I, I see your point there, if they're decoupled, th that maybe going concurrently is a good idea. Um, but I believe the shuttle program kind of proved this point that using humans to haul freight is not necessarily a good idea. If it's, it's something like that where there's no overarching human imperative, it's better to offload that from human beings. Totally. So if you lose it, well, totally agree. And, but if, you're, if I'm sending a human mission, then I'd say that all the missions should be done with the humans there. That's, that's my point. Okay. I, you know, the, the other way of looking at, at that, though, is, you know, Dr. Zubrin, I think, wrote an article, Are We Killing Enough Astronauts? Mm -hmm. You know, at, the, at a certain point, you have to say it, human life is valuable, but you just, you can't, you know, it's imp the mission is what is is the most important thing, and we can't pretend we're going to go to Mars and people aren't going to die. You know, if people not dying is more important than going to Mars, then we're not going. So, th you your thoughts on that? stay on the ground. So, um, all right. So, all right. Is that it? Do we have, do we have enough oh, time for one more? One. Okay. All right. Uh, listening to your presentation, thought came to mind. Is there a difference in your mind between? Uh, a human mission aided by robotics and computers versus, say, a, a mission of robots and computers and machines aided by humans? Is there, is there a difference? And if there is one, which would you think would be more successful? Well, I, I think there's always going to be uh, a role, both near and, er and far space, for unmanned operations. You know, as you said, if, if humans and, and, and what unmanned missions can do is always going to increase. I think if you're going to send humans anyway, having, they're going to have some type of robotic assistance. They're not going to, you know, it's not us versus the robots. They're going to be our assistants. They're going to be working together. I guess, again, what I'm saying is, is that they should be working concurrently so that you don't need the, uh, the mission resilience of autonomy to prepare for a, a human mission and have them never have to break down or have something that they can't handle. Yeah, Would you agree that on Mars we're going to need lots of duct tape? <laughs> Duct tape solves a lot of problems. You know, you, you laugh, but when they had to put together the CO2 scrubbers on the Apollo 13, they were putting them together with duct tape. Without duct tape, they would have choked. They would have Duct suffocated. tape and WD-40. <laughs> exactly. 